Despite everything written about Jimi Hendrix since his death, vital questions remain unanswered. The Joker to the thief. There's far too much confusion. And I can't since 1970, declassified government documents, new witness statements, and pathological evidence have revealed a much clearer picture. It is now clear that Hendrix was not only aware that his life was in danger, but that he had deep, strong premonitions of his own death. No what any of this is really worth. He looked me square in the eyes and said, I won't be here. And I said, what do you mean won't be here? He says, is it because I, I won't be in my body, I'll be dead. Out of the blue, uh, he said to the reporter, I doubt I'll live to be 28 years old. There's no reason to get excited. I asked him, would he be going, would he be going back to Seattle? Like he said, next time I go to Seattle, it'll be in a pine box. There are many here among us now. And now, with the examination of declassified FBI documents from the 60s, it appears that Hendrix's death may be far more sinister. A political assassination. The 1960s saw a sea change in American politics and culture. The anti-Vietnam demonstrations and the rise of the Black Power movement caused rioting in the streets. A new youth culture emerged in both the black and white communities. A paranoid Richard Nixon and the FBI's J. Edgar Hoover would go to any lengths to prevent the emergence of strong leaders that could influence these young men and women, even murder. Potential leaders included rock musicians who commanded the attention of millions. Hendrix linked up with the Black Panthers, and for that reason, he was a dead man. Two people are central to the Hendrix story. One is his manager, Mike Jeffrey. Mike Jeffries was a very strange, slightly shady character that sort of existed on the managerial sort of aspect of rock music. Always walked around in dark glasses with a kind of off-the-shoulder camel hair coat and things, you know, and looked a bit like a kind of caricature mafia, um, spoke in a whisper. Um, he wasn't terribly well liked, as far as I recall. Everybody was very suspicious of Mike Jeffries, and I think with some genuine reasons. The second person is Monica Danneman, a 24-year-old German woman who spent the last few days of Jimmy's life with him. Monica was a kind of like ex- ice skating star that was sort of show business character, you know, and she wanted to get her foot in the door, I think, of, uh, of um, celebrity rock, rock doom, and Jimmy was a, a great entrance. Monica's memories of the day before Jimmy died were dim, but she remembered going to Ronnie Scott's club so Jimmy could jam with Eric Burden and his new band, War. Devon Wilson was already at the club. Devon had known Jimmy for some years. Devon had come up the hard way, a prostitute on the streets of New York at 15 and now a muse to various rock stars, including Mick Jagger and Jimmy. Jimmy's sexual appetite was enormous and Devon would organize his diary, recording sessions, drugs and women. Devon was bisexual and did not give up her female lovers for Jimmy. In fact, she would organize the threesomes Jimmy loved. Jimmy probably loved Devon. It was said that Devon could score dope for Jimmy anywhere in the world. It was Chaz Chandler, bass player in The Animals, who discovered the unknown and penniless Jimi Hendrix playing at the Café Wa in New York. Acting on a hunch and his musical knowledge, he sold his guitars and borrowed money to bring Hendrix to London. He went out on a considerable limb, um, as far as I was concerned, because when I first saw Jimmy, which was on his first day in London, and Chas rang me up and said, he's arrived, and I'm taking him down to the speakeasy tonight. Do you want to come down and, and meet him and hear him jam? And I went down and listened to him play that night, and he was jamming with Brian Auger and a few other musicians down there, just the speakeasy house band. Uh, and he was magnificent. He was wonderful uh, uh, as a musician. But to me, it was like listening to somebody like Wes Montgomery, you know, because he was such a clever musician. And I just said to Chaz, quite honestly, Chaz, I said, I, I can see this going straight over the heads of the fans. 
I cannot see this guy making it because he's almost too good. You know, and Charles said, not if I have anything to do with it, he won't. And of course, what he really meant was that he was going to change his image, uh, change his um, uh, publicity and his whole approach to things so that he would get the attention that perhaps, as a mere technician, he wouldn't have done previously. In the story of Jimi Hendrix, we cut to probably September, October. We're back in London and Eric calls up, Eric Clapton and says that we're doing a gig tonight at University College. Could you please come? Because the guest we've got tonight is just probably the greatest guy I've ever met. So everybody's working hard and we all play hard and we all turned up. And um, Eric had played a couple of numbers when he stops and did the most phenomenal introduction for this guy. And out came Jimi Hendrix. And he played the same set he played in New York. But it was just, it was like 10, 10 steps up from what he played before because the crowd was so much bigger. And I looked at Andrew, Andrew looked at me, and, and we both agreed, yeah, we've got to sign him. It was too late. Little did we know that Linda Keith had taken Chaz Chandler to see Jimmy the Falling Night, and he signed him. One of the uh, first times he had a chance to play for the English audience, uh, was with The Cream, and uh, The Cream were just getting started out, of course, Eric Clapton on lead guitar, and uh, nobody had ever jammed with him before. And, I mean, they were just like, well, who is Jimi Hendrix, and why does he want to jam with us? But sure enough, he talked his way into meeting Jack Bruce at a, uh, at a pub uh, close by and said, you know, hey, I'd like to jam with you. I'm Jimi Hendrix. I'm over here from, from America. And uh, he came up on stage, played two songs with The Cream, two blues songs that he updated to... Uh, with a, this driving electric sound, and Clapton was blown away, according to uh, Jack Bruce. He said that uh, nobody had ever done this before, and uh, here comes Jimi Hendrix coming along, setting up the uh, great electric blues guitar players of that time, like Jeff Beck and Pete Townsend, who were kind of, I, I guess, a little bit uh, scared of, who's this guy that can play circles around us? Distasteful though it may seem to us today, Chaz Chandler dubbed Hendrix the Wild Man of Borneo, and sold him as the Black Elvis. Chaz Chandler encouraged these crass expressions because it increased Jimmy's publicity. He was also dubbed Mau Mau, and not surprisingly denounced by Mary Whitehouse. Hey, hey, Joe, I say. I heard you shot your woman down, you shot her down now. Within weeks, Hey Joe shot into the British top ten to be followed by the hugely well-received debut album Are You Experienced, which was kept off the top of the charts only by Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Yes, I did a shot of You know I kind of mess around, mess around town. In the summer of 1967, Jimmy played the Monterey International Pop Festival, and stole the show. Overnight, he became a superstar on both sides of the Atlantic. His appeal to the kids no doubt strengthened by this coruscating review of Are You Experienced, which appeared in the New York Times. The album cover reinforces the degeneracy theme, with the three sneering out from beneath their bouffant hairdos, looking like surreal hermaphrodites. The disc itself is a nightmare show with lust and misery. The explosion, I think, was caused by the, I don't know, the war in Vietnam, the rebellion against it, uh, the uh, flower power era, you know, um, the hippie movement or whatever you want to call it. And uh, acts like Jimi Hendrix were so different that the kids were yearning for something different. And when he came on the scene, he just exploded. I mean, everybody went crazy. I went crazy. It was so new. And... Um, and different, and he was so, uh, oh, um, I saw him live so many times. He was so magnetic on stage. I mean, he just controlled the audience. And um, it was an exciting time. I mean, um, a lot of bands, you know, who broke at that particular time uh, with Hendrix. I mean, it was just a whole different scene. <laughs> 